All right. This is a story that appeared in the uh, fall 2000 issue of Route 66 magazine. It's called The Last Phone Call. The cattle gave us a blank look seen only in bovine eyes as the Yukon ground through years of accumulated disdain for the desert. To add to their confusion, I lowered the window, then mooed at the assembled throng. The response on their collective faces was one of, Why does that cow get to ride around while we stand here in this damned heat? <laughs> Jesse Taylor and I were grinding along in four-wheel drive about 50 miles in an hour and a half north of Route 66 climbing over rocks one minute and digging through sand the next. We were on our way across the Mojave National Perver Preserve to the site of the famed Mojave phone booth. That remote piece of retro technology standing as a portal to the world for the lost or stranded traveler. Yeah, like AAA is going to bail you out of this mess. <laughs> the phone booth has received considerable, considerable publicity over the past few years as media and the net have brought this lonely site to the attention of the world. On Easter weekend of 1999, Jesse and I interviewed Godfrey Daniels of Tempe, Arizona on our Saturday morning radio show. Godfrey is responsible for the phone booth being on the web and gaining the worldwide notoriety that has made it one of the busiest phones in the entire world. When it was decided we were going to explore the desert for the magazine, well, a visit to the phone booth was a natural. 14.7 miles from the pavement, we finally arrived. The phone line reaches up from the booth to hang on a series of wooden poles marching north and south through the Joshua trees of the high desert. It was 3.15 in the afternoon on April the 10th when we pulled up to the booth and the phone was ringing. I jumped from the Yukon, grabbed the phone and answered, Mojave phone booth! <laughs> it was Michael from Pennsylvania. What's going on, he asked. Well, it's 72 degrees, a light wind is blowing from the west and the sky is beautiful, I said then explained who I was and what we were working on and that we were working on an article about the phone booth. Cool. It really is, I answered. So what are you up to? I found this number on the web and thought it was some kind of a scam. So this is really a phone booth in the middle of the desert. Sure is. Nobody here but me and Jesse and a hundred head of cattle. That's really neat. The calls would continue until we left four and a half hours later. There was Dorothy, who wouldn't tell us where she was calling from, Dino from Denver, Sean from Long Beach, and Lindsay from San Antonio, who was having a bad day. She'd partied a little too much over the weekend and didn't feel all that well. Thomas from Michigan wanted to know what the weather was like. The most unusual call of the afternoon was from Nathan in Gilbert, Arizona. It was a TTY relay, because Nathan is hearing impaired. The operator would take a message from him and relay it to me, then I would answer and she would type my response back to Nathan. The call took nearly 15 minutes, but was interesting as Nathan's expressed his excitement at actually talking to someone at the Mojave phone booth. When he learned we worked for Route 66 magazine, he became even more excited. So Nathan, when you read this, it was great talking to you, man. What is the attraction of this rather ordinary phone booth? Why do people from around the world call 760-733-9969? How is a cult built up around what has been termed the loneliest phone booth on earth? A little over three years ago, a telephone, that would have been 1996, a telephone Nikon was spotted on a map of the Mojave by a high desert, high desert aficionado. On a day trip from L.A., he set out to see if there was truly a phone booth in the middle of the, of the Mojave Desert. After finding the booth, he wrote a letter to a magazine telling about his trip, the booth, and providing the phone number. Since then, websites have been built around the booth, TV news programs have featured it, and from internet publicity, the booth has exploded with fame. The attraction of the booth seems to be an attempt to touch someone, figuratively, uh, easy for me to say, <laughs> a million miles away, and become a part of a global community in the process. Another theory espoused by UCLA socio sociologist Warren Ten Houghton is the get a life factor. Some people just have nothing to do, so they pursue shreds of information that have no value. It amuses me, but there's something pitiful about it, too, he said. Ah, please, Warren, it's just a phone booth in the middle of nowhere. People like to call it to see who's here. What's pitiful is Warren has never been out here. He's never experienced the pure fun of talking to someone from Scotland while standing in the middle of the desert, while ten feet away a cow dumps her opinion of the whole situation on the sand. 
The Mojave phone booth is not something to be dissected by the sociologists of the world or feared by the talk radio paranoiacs. The phone booth is an example of something that occasionally comes along to relieve the boredom of everyday life. One of the amazing, amazing things is that the amount of traffic is the amount of graffiti on the phone booth. Yeah, it's covered with magic, ma magic marker and Sharpie comments, but there's nothing obscene or nasty. Just people leaving messages and their names, like Pete and Betty inside of a heart. Another cool point is the area is clean. There's no litter. You bring it in, you haul it out. That's the unspoken rule out here. Oh, excuse me, it's ringing again. Mojave phone booth. It's Patrick from Michigan. What's going on, man? Just hanging out in the middle of the desert and answering the phone, I answered. It's really in the middle of the desert. It's not like at a truck stop or something. Nope. It's nearly 15 miles from the last shred of pavement, and we had a four-wheel drive to get in here. Wow, that's really cool. In, ten minutes, in a 10-minute span, Jesse took calls from George in Scotland, Roland in England, and an unidentified person from Finland. Guam checked in, as did Canada. Then we had some visitors. Drew and Edith from Santa Cruz, California, showed up and took their turns at answering the phone. State names began piling up as calls from Kentucky, Maine, California, Massachusetts, Florida, Rhode Island, and Oklahoma were taken. WAAF in Boston called. Drew explained to Mistress Carey who we were and what we were doing, and as the Boston area was treated to a live on-the-air report from the middle of the Mojave Desert. Then the phone went nuts as callers from the Boston area checked in to make sure it wasn't just some DJ gag. <laughs> around, seven, around 7, things began to slow down a bit. Marisha from Oregon checked in, along with Pat from Oklahoma City and a technician with Pacific Bell, checking to see if anyone would answer the phone. <laughs> 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 One of the more interesting calls was from an 84-year-old widow who calls the phone booth every single day just to see who's out there. She says the daily call makes her feel as if she is still in touch with the world. I learned from the website that people are afraid the phone booth is going to become too well known. That concern almost made me choose not to do this article, then I concluded it was too good a tale not to tell. But I've decided not to reveal the exact location, so you'll have to hunt for it, just like we did. It's not easy to find, and the, phone is be and the road is best tackled in a four-wheel drive vehicle. If you decide to go, take along water and some food. No convenience stores out here, along with a good sense of humor. Want to find it on the web? Just do a search for Mojave Phone Booth. Oh, one other thing. You won't find the directions there either. Got to go. It's ringing again. Mojave Phone Booth. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There you go. Makes me want to go find it, but it's not there anymore. No. In fact, that's the, that's oh. the sad thing about it. Um, let me get back here. Uh, the phone booth disappeared in mid-May. Pacific Bell and the grand tradition of corporate America bent the truth, stating they knew nothing about it. My God, was it stolen? The <laughs> National Park Service also denied knowing anything. Oh, my God, no. Aliens. Aliens abducted it. <laughs> they wanted to probe its coin slot. <laughs> A couple of days later, Pac, tell, Pac Bell admitted they had been working with the NPS for months and it was decided to remove the booth. The Park Service used concerns over damage to the environment as their rationale. Mm. I can't buy that. I never could buy that because the area was pristine and, as I said, the phone booth itself wasn't covered with obscene graffiti. The people who went to the extent to go out there and visit this thing cherished it and took care of it. But it's gone. That's too bad. Yeah. But you know, immortalized in that article. Yeah. For forever. I. That's. God. Talk about a. Talk about true Western romance, right there. Right. That's yep. it. You know, out out there with the cows and the and the sagebrush. Oh. In a telephone booth. And I'll, I'll tell you, getting out of there. Oh my God. It was dark. Well, it was twilight when we pulled out to leave. Mm-hmm. Within just a couple of miles, it was dark. And so I had to find my way down this hardly visible track. And uh, you get back down to a power line road. There's huge power, you know, those gigantic right. power lines. So there's a power line road there. And uh, we, we were heading, we were actually going to Vegas to go to the uh, National Association of Broadcasters convention starting the next day. So I thought, well, 
we'll go into Baker and get a motel. So when we came to the power line road, I made a right and started off. Well, it was horrible. It was dark. I'm running all the lights I've got on the vehicle. And uh, Jesse says, are you sure this is going to take us anywhere? I said, if we go west far enough, we'll hit the Kell Baker Highway. I know it's over there. <laughs> and the compass was showing west, so we were going the right way. But I'll tell you what, that was, we went down cliff faces and up hilltops. It was just bizarre. It was worse getting out of there than it had been getting in there. <laughs> Only, I think, because it was dark and I had no clue where the hell that road was going. But we finally wound up in, uh, in Baker that night. We stayed at the Bun Boy Motel. <laughs> yeah. I know the Bun Boy you Motel. You know the Bun Boy? I know the Bun Boy Motel. And we ate at the Greek's place. <laughs> I Have don't you know, no, I don't know that. But oh. I do know the Bun Boy Motel. Oh, oh the Greek's place is outstanding. <laughs> But that, you know, the next day we went on into Vegas and we went we spent 3 days traipsing around the NAB convention hall. That's when we were putting together uh KRTE, which is now KGZA. We were buying full digital equipment for that station. Brand new station going up in Williams. There you go. Yep.